Let's continue our discussion on quantum mechanics and we are going to start with the set of experiments that could not be explained by the classical theory of physics. And physicists in the early 20th century looked at a particular experimental result. What they tried to do is explain and derive equations based on an assumption that that phenomenon is either particle-based or wave-based. So we're going to start by looking at the first phenomenon which is referred to as the black body radiation. This is a uh, an observation associated with things that are heated uh, up to very high temperature. So uh, as you know from experience if you were to start heating things this is not really things like water but you know more like metals and stuff uh, you start to see that that object will emit light well, everyday example that I can present here is these three right here so for example if you burn paper at some point you're gonna see some type of embers uh, or light coming out of the pieces of paper or maybe coal if you've ever seen coal burning in a barbecue grill here is a electric stove which is composed of metal that's being heated at very high temperature and as the temperature gets to a certain value then the pieces of metal will start glowing which means that it's emitting light and of course the most common example that we use here is the incandescent light bulb which is basically a wire that's made out of tungsten and it's heated to very high temperature and eventually at that very high temperature it starts to glow or emit light the explanation for all of these phenomena is called black body radiation one of the observations associated associated with all of these glowing objects at very high temperatures that when you heat it the intensity of the light will go up based on the type of color that's emitting but eventually it will come down at very very low wavelengths so for example this metal will emit mostly red light but it wouldn't emit any blue light or ultraviolet light so there is a peak and then afterwards it drops if you do a, the heating at a different temperature so this one was at 5000 Kelvin but if you go to 7000 Kelvin for example that curve would shift and it would emit a different kind of light so maybe at that point it would start emitting yellow light but again it would sort of die down after that at lower wavelengths so all of this is uh, just observation both of these curves here correspond to observations so what the scientists try to do is explain um, with theory how that works and the best explanation at the time used an equation that's based on the idea that there's a transfer of energy between the electron in the atoms that make up these pieces of metal that's being heated so they are oscillating or they're vibrating at very high frequency and that high frequency vibration is transferred out as light it turns out that that classical theory didn't really match the experimental curve so as you can see here the dotted line represents the actual classical theory and they are able to match the right side of the curve but they fail to match the left side of the curve so in other words there's a prediction that they intensity of this light that's being emitted is just going to keep going higher and higher and higher at very low wavelength which is of course the high energy region of light so the prediction is then called ultraviolet catastrophe because even though nobody could find anything wrong with the explanation or the equation this classical theory is predicting that there's going to be a large number of very high energy radiation that's being emitted by all these objects right and of course that's not true because what we observe is that there is a drop in the intensity as you go to a lower wavelength. So the person who was able to figure out an alternative solution was Max Planck and he's really the father of modern physics. He basically looked at these curves and made the following assumption. The energy that is being transferred from those highly vibrating electrons in the atoms can only have a specific set of values. It can't have continuous values like what the classical physicists modeled. So only with that assumption will the plot actually match the observational plot that people saw for the black body radiation. So Planck's equation has the following form. E, which is energy of the light that's being emitted, is equal to n h nu the frequency of light as we saw in the prior video h is a special constant that is now called the Planck's constant it's basically a constant that he was able to find by fitting the his theory to the experimental curve the value of the Planck's constant is given right here 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules second and n is an integer it's a positive integer it can have values of 1 2 3 etc and what he's saying is basically the following that the energy of light 
light comes in the form of packets of H nu. N is the number of packets in this case. So it could be one packet, two packets, three packets, but it has to come in chunks of values of H nu. It can't have a continuous value and be 1.3 packets of H nu. That value just doesn't exist. And by restricting the energy to those specific values, he's able to model and fit the black body radiation. So this is actually the plots that Planck's generate at different temperature. And as you can see, it was similar to the plot that's actually observed from experiment. Now, I'm just going to briefly mention how he was able to do this. If you want a lot more detail, you should take a physics class on this. But the way Planck was able to use this new idea of restricting the values of energy is really based on looking at another equation that has very similar plot distribution, which is the uh, distribution of molecular speed or kinetic energy that was given in the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. And this was something that we had discussed a couple of chapters ago. As you can see, the shape of these plots is very similar to the shape of the plots that are shown in the black body radiation. That's sort of what gave Planck the idea that perhaps the equation used in the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation could be applied to the case of the black body radiation. Although Planck was able to derive this equation, he didn't quite understand why the energy had to be restricted. Because, of course, in everyday life, when we do a particular activity, so for example, if I were to lift a book, I don't necessarily have to restrict the lifting of that book to specific heights. I can move my book to any height I want. I'm not restricted to lifting that book only to one foot, two feet, three feet. I can lift it to 1.5 feet if I want to, or 0.7 feet. So there's no comparable behavior that we can observe in daily life. And that's the reason why it was confusing to Planck why the plot can only be explained by forcing the energy to be restricted to specific values. Still, that was what the equation that worked for the experimental prediction. So that's what was used. So the take home message here is that you have to restrict the energy of vibrating electrons and atoms in this case to discrete specific values. So the term that was used to say this packet of energy or this discrete value of energy is called the quantum of energy. Quantum just means like a packet. This is a problem with the discussion we just had with Planck's model of the black body radiation. It tells us that the electron oscillates with an energy of 6.52 times 10 to the minus 18 joules in a black body. Assuming that all the energy is transferred, how many packets of orange light will be emitted? And orange light in this case has a wavelength of 610. So to solve a problem like this, you're going to need your Planck's equation, which is E is equal to n times h nu. We have to relate that to wavelength, which just means rewriting it as n h c over lambda. Once you get that, you have to solve for the packets. Packets, remember, is the quanta of uh, energy of light. That's the symbol n in the equation. When we solve for n, it becomes lambda times e over h times c. And all we need to do is plug in all the numbers that we have, again, in appropriate units. So just make sure that the units will cancel out, meters goes away, joules goes away, and seconds goes away. So the quantity itself is actually unitless because remember that what the number n represents is just the number of packets of energy that can be transferred. So in this case, the number is slightly above 19. So we would say that there's 19 packets of energy that will be emitted by this electron that's oscillating with that energy. The next discovery that also challenged the understanding of the particle wave idea at the time was the observation of the photoelectric effect. In the late 19th century, Hertz discovered that when you have a surface of a metal like this, okay, so it could be a metal desk, you shine light on the metal, it turns out that a specific type of light can cause the metal to emit electrons. So this picture here shows that this is a piece of metal, and if I shine it with red light at 700 nanometers, it's actually not going to generate any electrons, but if I shine it with green light, I will see some electron. If I shine it with purple light, I will also see an electron being emitted. And I can detect that electron using an apparatus that looks like this, where the electron flow is 
is electricity, so that could easily be detected by some kind of a current meter. The type of electron that's emitted is not always the same electron. Uh, the speed of the electron actually changes depending on the frequency of the light that hits it. So there's actually specific requirements before you can observe this effect, which is referred to as the photoelectric effect, because you use light, which is photo, to generate electricity. The condition that the photoelectric effect can happen is the following. First off, the number of electrons that you emit depend on the intensity of the incident light. So that just means that the brighter the light, the more electrons is going to be emitted. However, in order for the electrons to be emitted, the frequency of the incident light, so the light that hits the surface of the metal, has to be at least a certain value, which we call the threshold frequency, or given the symbol nu naught. So unless it has that value, it's not going to emit any electron. So that's the reason why you see here with red light, there's no electron, but then with green and purple, which have a higher frequency, then you start seeing electrons being emitted. Now, once you hit it with those lights, if you make these lights brighter, then you're going to get more electrons being emitted. And then the second observation is that the kinetic energy of the electron itself, which is correlated to the speed of the electron, right? The kinetic energy of the electron depends on the frequency frequency of light. So the higher frequency light, like the purple light here, will generate a higher kinetic energy, which you can see here because the speed is greater for this electron compared to the speed of this electron. Physicists at the time couldn't really explain why that is because the understanding at the time is that light is a wave and its energy depends on its intensity, which means that if you make the light brighter and brighter and brighter, eventually you're going to be able to knock out an electron even if you use red light. But in the experiment, that was not observed. So when they made the red light really, really bright, you still don't see any electron being ejected. The metals get hotter, but aside from that, nothing else happens. So the person who was able to propose a solution to this was Albert Einstein. And in fact, he won the Nobel Prize for this explanation. And what he's saying is that it's not to model light as a wave, which is the classical view of this. But he said that looking at what Planck had proposed, which is that the energy of light is actually behaving more like a particle energy which means that it comes in specific chunks of value, that quantum of energy that Planck was proposing before. If you imagine that light comes as like a marble, a certain amount of energy, and it hits that electron, then the idea of it becomes a little easier to understand because if it hits it hard enough, then the electron is going to be ejected off the surface of the metal because the electrons are arrayed here on top of this metal, and uh, it has a certain amount of glue called binding energy that is holding it on to the atom. This was a really radical change in the way people view light because prior to this, the way light is modeled is always as a wave. So if you start thinking about light as particle, you're really discarding the assumptions that people have used for hundreds of years in terms of how to model light. Einstein, of course, proposed this not without any evidence. He said that, okay, so if we assume that light comes in as this packet of energy, which later on is called photons, so that's a particle of light, and each particle has an energy equals to h nu, which is Planck's equation. If you use that, you should be able to explain this phenomenon. If the energy equals h nu, then the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And at some point, you're going to have enough of a frequency to be able to knock out your electrons. So there is a threshold frequency, which is exactly what was observed in the experiment. In addition to proposing that explanation for the photoelectric effect, Einstein also derived an equation to calculate how fast the speed of the electron should be when it's ejected off the surface of the metal. And the way he did it is actually fairly straightforward and something that you would be able to do because you know the equation of a line. He plot the kinetic energy of the electron that's observed as they are leaving the surface of the metal and to the threshold frequency that allows the electron to be emitted. Each metal has a different threshold frequency. So here we're showing five different metals. Potassium has the lowest threshold frequency at this value right here. And then platinum has the highest threshold frequency. Okay, so it takes light of this frequency in order to knock out platinum. And you can see that this is sort of color coded here because this threshold frequency corresponds to a orange light. This threshold frequency corresponds to a purple light. So that is higher energy, that's lower energy. Now, one thing that you notice immediately with all these lines 
points is that they all have the same slope. He tried to figure out what the slope is. The slope of these lines was found to be exactly the value of Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule second. So this is a huge discovery, right? Because how coincidental is that, that the slope of all of these lines happen to be exactly Planck's constant as well? So there must be something about the behavior of these photoelectric effect experiment that is matching what Planck was proposing in terms of the energy of light. Now, the second thing he did to find the y-intercept was he just extrapolated the line of each of these metals all the way to the zero intercept. Interestingly, they all have the same value for that specific line, and the value is negative h nu naught for that specific metal. So the y-intercept here would be negative h nu naught for potassium. This one here is going to be negative h nu naught for sodium, and so on. And using the equation of the line, which is y equals mx plus b, all he did was substitute all those values that I just described, which is that y is the kinetic energy, that's the y-axis. m, remember, is h, is Planck's constant, so times x. What is the x-axis? It's frequency. So kinetic energy is equal to h times nu, the equation is actually right here, plus the y-intercept, it's negative h nu naught. So that's the equation that Einstein proposed for the photoelectric effect behavior. And using this equation, he's able to calculate how fast electrons are going to come out when they are hit by light on a surface of a metal. Now this h nu naught quantity is actually very important. This corresponds to the amount of energy that is holding the electron in the atom, right? And of course that depends on the strength of attraction between the electron and the proton in the nucleus. We call this energy two different names. One is ionization energy, and ionize means to pull it out of the atom. The second terminology we use here is the work function, and it just refers to the fact that in order to remove this, we need to do work on that electron, which is to push it out with a certain velocity. And the symbol for the work function is this Greek letter phi. The major importance of Einstein's discovery, and the reason why he won the Nobel Prize for this, is not only did he explain something that was not explained, explainable before, but he explained it using something that's really radical, which is to assume that light behaves like a particle instead of waves, which is what people have assumed for a couple of hundred years. That gave people a new view of light and understanding of how to model light. After Einstein's discovery, we don't just think of light as a classical wave in this case, but it also can be modeled as a particle, and that results in the understanding that light is a unique type of phenomenon that is called a wave particle duality because it can behave both like a wave and like a particle. This is the first example that people saw. Here we have a problem on the photoelectric effect and the question says the work function for lithium is 279.7 kilojoules per mole. What is the maximum wavelength of light that can remove an electron from an atom on the surface of lithium metal? So we go back and start with Einstein's equation which is kinetic energy of the electron is equal to the energy of the incoming photon minus the work function. In this question, we're being asked for the work function, and they told us the maximum wavelength of light. Wavelength, that's related to the energy of the photon, where the energy of the photon is equal to hc over lambda. Now, if you're asking about the maximum wavelength of light, another way to say that question is that you are asking for the minimum amount of energy, because lambda is in inversely proportional to energy. Maximum lambda means minimum energy, and that's what I wrote down here. So what is the minimum photon energy that is needed? We have our electrons on the surface of the metal, and we're going to have some kind of a photon that's coming in and hitting the electron, and that would cause this electron to just get ejected off the surface of the metal. So the minimum energy needed to do that must be an energy that is equal to the the work function itself, right? Because the work function represents the energy that is holding the electron to the atoms. You can write this equation where E of the photon that you're going to need is going to be exactly equal to the work function itself. Now, of course, E of the photon, we just said it's going to be HC over lambda. So then lambda itself is going to be HC over the work function. The next thing to think about here is the fact that when we are doing the photoelectric effect explanation, the interaction that occurs is really between one photon to one electron. The information that we're given for the work function is kilojoules per mole of electrons. So we're going to have to recalculate that and express that 
for one electron. And to do that, we just take the value that we're given and then use Avogadro's number to help us convert that so that we get the energy needed to knock out one electron, which is going to be this number right here. And then what you do is you plug that back into that lambda equation. Lambda is equal to hc over the work function. And that will give you a wavelength of this magnitude, which if you convert to nanometer will just be 427.8 nanometer.